the manager of uh, Matters of the Soul, a non-profit organization. In Afrikaans, it is Saka van die Seel. And um, in South Africa, this is a non-profit trust. And um, I'm doing these bi-weekly Facebook talks about various topics that I think is relevant to, um, to what's going on. And tonight, we are going to deal with a woman's worth. Um, are you just your dress size or are you a bit more than that? And, and hopefully we're going to look at how to discover your true identity. Now I'm going to have a look at um, various things tonight. So I'm going to first off just have a look at the broad ideas of women in this culture. And um, especially me being from South Africa, uh, we deal with a, a melting pot of cultures. Um, but predominantly coming from a Western culture and um, <clears throat> a lot of people that I know, um, the way that women are treated in the Western culture, but I also look at other cultures, but general principles, and I'll have a look at uh, what you can think about the media's current influence on women's bodies. And, and then we'll have a look at um, what, what uh, you can actually do about it and your weight and your body image and uh, the, the cycles that you find yourself in there, some of the psychology that you can uh, think of with cognitive behavioral therapy. And then we'll have a look at your faith, uh, your Christian faith and body image. So it's a whole lot we're going to talk about and hopefully going to be able to cover all of those in this hour. Um, now, let me just give some background. Uh, I've been married for 20 years now. Um, I'm surrounded by a lot of women in my life. Yes, I don't have a, a harem or what do you call that? But I um, I have a lot of um, contact with with women and I've had lots of discussions either in my clinical practice or at, um, at private discussions with other people. And I could pick up a lot of struggles with women about their uh, bodies and about being happy with their bodies. And um, I I think I only know maybe one or two ladies who are really satisfied with their bodies who, are, who say, no, I'm happy with it. Um, I, I, I accept myself the way I am. I predominantly know ladies and women who would say, no, this is too long. That's too short. This is too wide. This is too narrow. This hangs, this uh, droops, this whatever. But, you know, uh, and that's concerned me for years um, <clears throat> because I've seen Christian women as well battling over this and then even becoming either obsessed about it or depressed about it or aggressed about it. So we'll have a look at all those reactions. But it's uh, it's so prevalent and it is so common that um, that women struggle with this all the time. So even if you give a lady a compliment, she'll negate it or dismiss it and say, oh, no, you know, this is he, he, or he, or <laughs> she could spend two hours trying to, you know, preparing herself and, and actually look strikingly beautiful. And then you'll say that to her and some ladies will say, oh, thank you. But uh, many a times I'll find that people have battles with their self image and their body image. And, and many a times their worth will be connected to how they look. They, if you talk to people and you say, is your self-worth connected to how you physically look? People will say, no, I don't think so. I don't think my, my worth is connected to my looks. But once you start to peel the onion uh, and the layers, you'll find, me included as a male, um, that, my, that my looks, you know, so that it's important. So if I do not look good, and for me, that would mean if my sides would be long so i would look old because uh, i'm already don't have a lot up there in terms of hair it's the brains they push out the hair so um can't help that you know i've ended up on top uh, so what happens is in my my hair then uh, doesn't look good for me and i actually worry about what other people might think of me are they going to think i'm He's looking like an old man and he's older before his age. And it was a crisis for me when I was uh, 19 and I was starting to get bold. So for me personally, my own worth was connected to my looks um, and my identity. 
and my acceptance of myself and my social confidence. So, but I find that amongst women. I don't know how many ladies older than 40 go swim in a bikini uh, at the beach. So, um, and uh, sometimes they reach their ideal weight, but they still battle with this is not good enough that's not good enough so it just never gets there and you just never get to a place of peace so let's just have a look at all these things so how are women seen in the world today are women only their faces and bodies um, and uh, why do christian women struggle to feel good about themselves their bodies and how they look and uh, what can we do about the pressure on so of society to be thin and beautiful and um, what does the research say about this and um, what does the Bible say? So let's have a look. Okay, so the media and the culture, there's lots of research. The correlation between your body image and what the media shows has been proven uh, a lot, especially even now with social media, um, that there's a, there's a big correlation between how, especially even from the ages of seven, ladies see themselves when they when they have a look at um, social media images they can even develop eating disorders uh, one study has shown that um, among among european african or uh, european american and african american girls between the ages of seven and twelve that greater overall exposure uh, to these media images of the ideal body predicted a thinner ideal body shape so that means they they would ideal, ideally want that shape and a higher level of disordered eating one year later. So it was just correlated. And social media appears to be correlated to body image concerns as well. So there was a, a lot of um, research on that, which just showed that the more you were scrolling through Instagram and Facebook and posting pictures of yourself, um, that um, you might experience more negative thoughts about your body just interesting i'm going to the depths of those research but it's interesting so depending on uh the culture the cultures vary there's um there's a uh, a difference in how various cultures sees ladies and their bodies but um mostly the woman is the beautiful one and they need to be pretty and beautiful whatever the size may be whether you should be thin in the italian um, ideal is this uh, really thin lady if she turns to the side you can't see her anymore the spanish one is the difference uh, she's more voluptuous and curvy um, and i mean they're close to each other as countries but they the the cultures the norms um prefer different looks but whatever it may be there's a standard that the culture sets for this is the standard of how you need to look whether you and are you going to meet that standard are you too thin are you too too overweight what is it and the effect of that is that i am not good enough and if i'm on that standard can i remain on that standard um that, that standard then defines me so um some of the quotes that i've got here is that the beauty ideal in, in the american culture is thin uh, there's a normative obsession with beauty, sh body shape, and size. Uh, the ongoing, ongoing concern is accepted and completely normal and even in, an inevitable part of being a modern girl, and that needs to be changed. Uh, we, we construct our identities in part through media images that we see. The more uh, girls are exposed to thin ideals, uh, that kind of thin body, the more they are dissatisfied with their bodies and with themselves overall so and they call that body dissatisfaction so you get to a place you get uh where you get dissatisfied with how you look and your body and how you look becomes more and more of uh the focus of how you how you deal now there's um, some more research that concludes everyone shows the social cultural bias against fatness and in favor of thinness it's interesting that almost 99 out of 100 people show that socio-cultural bias against fatness. Uh, now, again, in your culture, if your culture prefers a bit more weight, I mean, uh, then anything above that is fat. So it's just interesting. And there's an in the end, there's an overemphasis emphasis on the body as uh, as defining the self. So the body becomes the self. So you. Are then your body you are not 
your spirit, you are not your personality, you are not those, you are your body and then the rest tags along. You know, um, the girls who are the most strongly affected by this are the adolescent girls. Um, they start to diet, um, even at the age of 12, some girls are told to diet. They are told, no, you'll, you're too fat for this, or you won't fit into that, or look at that lady, they're compared to others. And in the end, they conclude, my weight determines my worth. And that's where we bring in a question, because if your weight determines your worth, that means you are constantly going to be in a weighty battle. Your, the scale in your bathroom and the mirror will be the judge. And in the end, you will um, be judged as being um, a featherweight or not, or a heavyweight. And in the end, that will leave you with a lot of emotional battles. Now, um, the media uses this. Obviously, what runs the world? Money. So money runs the world. Um, the Bible says it. Abba sang it. It is the money, money, money. And in the end, if you can make people insecure, you can get them to buy your stuff or to change themselves, to try to lose weight, to gain this ideal. If there's no ideal, everybody's okay. Well, we won't make money out of you. So advertising draws on your insecurities to convince you to buy a product. And in the end, this, this perfection becomes the actual image. They, uh, you are more likely to remain insecure, even if you get that to that level, because now you then actually have two reactions. You actually get a superior feeling that you are better than others or an inferior feeling. So you end up feeling better. You know, you walk in amongst the room, you see the girls, they scan each other. And I've seen that. And they, they judge mentally scan each other. You know, I've seen that. I observe ladies uh, and I sit and say, oh, there is the rating going on. It's like grade nine boys sitting on the beach with a girl walking past. Hey, seven out of ten, eight out of ten, nine out of ten. I mean, it's a joke, but girls do that. And what do they do? They say, uh, how do I compare with that lady? It's actually a huge insecurity. And, um, and in the end, if they compare favorably, then they feel pride, they feel better, they feel superior, which causes them to look down on the other one, um, and then fear that the other one looks down on them, so then they either feel inferior, so they will be looked down upon and then feel inferior. So it is also a pecking order. So it is destructive because what it does is it takes away who you are and takes away your giftings and, and takes away your 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 identity in the Lord, and we'll get to that. So you are then just your weight. In the end, um, what we deal with in the worst case scenario, you deal with stuff like body dysmorphic disorder. That's a mental health disorder in which you can't stop thinking about one or more dis perceived defects or flaws in your appearance, a flaw that appears minor or can't even be seen by others. So it gets to the place where it's so obsessive that the tiniest of flaws drives you nuts and makes you feel like you are hideous um, and you may, may feel so embarrassed ashamed and anxious as you might even avoid social situations now that's the extreme and on the other extreme end of it it is somebody who just does not care at all and just totally lets go and rebels against the system in a very harsh way but they actually rejects their own body along with it so just saying well i don't care you don't care i don't care i'm, I'm going to reject myself before you and, and in the process reject your judgment but then um, internally, I'm really just creating another problem for myself because I'm eliciting judgment. So what do you do? You're in a situation where the society around you judges you and uh, you then tend to judge yourself. So you sit with a lot of um, a lot of weighing up and judgment and it's hard. And I mean, men have similar battles and I'm going to deal with that in a different program. Um, and it's the same process, it's just different uh, content, it's just different things. But now, um, I mean, we'll get to what do you do. But so, body dissatisfaction, let's have a look at that. That's the negative subjective evaluation of your body as it relates to body size, shape, muscularity, muscle tone, weight and fitness. So it's the negative subjective, that means it's your view, evaluation. So you evaluate your body on all those areas. And uh, it's considered to be an important negative affective emotional factor related to body image. So that means 
people get dissatisfied um, because they look at their bodies negatively and they judge themselves negatively. Interesting. So the key here is that we compare ourselves um, and then we compare ourselves usually with two people who are in a um, perceived better position than we are. So we think they are better from our subjective perspective and then um, what we do is we uh, we actually then judge ourselves or blame ourselves or, or we reject this vehemently. So what do we do? We are constantly um, bombarded with beauty images and fixed images or, you know, they are fixed, the photoshopped images. And um, they, 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 I mean, people beautify themselves and all those things. So you, what you do is you actually compare yourself with the perfect ideal and if you do that, you'll be constantly experiencing the gap. You'll constantly be reaching and f striving for this ideal. Even if you've said, no, I don't care, and, you, and you're overweight, and you just live with it. Internally, you might be saying, but <clears throat> I don't look that way. Oh, I don't look that way. Oof. So I tend to just either def employ defense mechanisms of denial or justification or, you know, um, even reaction formation. That means I tend to act in the opposite way by rejecting it and saying no beautiful bodies you know and overweight is beautiful and, you know you do get that as well they call it beauty positive or body positive images that people celebrate being who they are but in the end they are still focusing on their bodies and and, um, and that's not bad but it is becomes an over focus there's an interesting um, interesting study that was done on st university students um, <clears throat> and they looked at celebrities and looking at celebrities made them feel worse about their bodies um, but interesting images of acquaintances came with an even more stronger link to body image concerns so that means if you look at a celebrity it's almost like ah oh, but that's you know that's not that's there but if you have somebody in your circle that's really pretty and that you feel Sure, you know, I see her every now and then, and and I'm in that social circle, and she, there's that lady again, and and uh, and then I, I feel inferior. So in the end, um, it is better to watch uh, to see body positive content, so uh, more realistic images. It is better, um, and it is a little bit better to see fitness images, but um, and and to boost your self compassion. But to be honest with you, all those fitness images, ha -ha, I'm jogging up the hill in my active wear, active wear. Just what, I, what just happens there is that you you just continually feel uh, I'm not I'm not like that. I don't do that. I don't run up hills with weights in my arms, or I do, but I'm going to try and look like them. And uh, I don't know. So they, there's a whole movement of hashtag Fitspo or Fitspiration, and in the end, it's trying to. Uh, counter the thin inspiration, which was a really thin bikini uh, look for women, um, and it is. Um, and, and what's happened with the fit inspiration is that it's trying to say, listen, listen, muscle is the new beautiful, and all those things. You need to be toned and beautiful, and but in the end, you, when you look at that and you compare yourself, uh, even we, if you do fit the picture, you sometimes look and you think, oh, uh, where do I fit? Am I inferior or superior? Um, okay, so in the worst case, it actually leads to negative mood, depression, anxiety. Actually, research shows after only 30 minutes of viewing fitness magazines, ladies uh, reported increased negative mood, depression, and anxiety. So when they show this athletic ideal. So the point is you're being bombarded, ladies. If you lived in the free state in 1827 uh, and you lived in on some farm with your friggin voortrekker rocky you know your uh the, the, the clothes that you had on was so um so it covered your whole body I and mean, then you probably did not have a chance to compare yourself to that many women and um you were not exposed to the major culture in your country and what the lady in cape town was now doing at the mountain and whether she was doing 30 push-ups or 70 in the end you wouldn't have had so much opportunity to um, compare yourself so interestingly, the media then pushes two uh, two types: that toned uh, athletic type or the thin type. 
So, and that gap between how you feel about yourself and how what they portray as the ideal, then just exacerbates how your body looks and the defects. I mean, my six back at the moment is a one back, you know, so I mean, this just doesn't work. So I constantly, when I have those pictures of the guys pulling up their shirts and they get these six packs, I mean, that are so cool and they just seem so sex bombs. I mean, what's that? And, um, and what actually happens is the more you look at that and you, and you compare yourself, the more you adopt a maladaptive uh, pattern of thinking, which leads to a maladaptive eating and exercise patterns. So in the end, you are comparing yourself and you are what we call internalizing and um, saying to yourself, I'm not good enough. I need to change. So what then happens is, is you get body guilt, you get, uh, you get lots of things, what we call objectification. That's when you treat yourself like an object. And some ladies reject their own bodies. I had a lady say to me that um, I, I have a mirror. I can see that I'm not good enough and beautiful enough. Um, so you can reject your own body then, um, or then even start to criticize your own body. So what then happens is, is there's a rejection right here. Um, in a Christian sense, that's cursing your own body. So that it's not blessing your own body, that's cursing and that would be sinful and meaning missing God's ideal. Um, okay, so what's the, and then you get what they call in the media fat stigmatization. So meaning anybody, anybody who's overweight then becomes stigmatized and, um, and you get all of this and you can even do that with yourself or others. So what's the solution? Is it is a solution to have a look at body uh, positive images uh, in part, but not really. Um, is it about loving your body? Um, but in the end, all those things are still have still still have a great focus on appearance, and it still keeps it with trying to just deal with the appearance. You know what? There's just an interesting bit of research on taking selfies. Um, they actually make you feel worse um, after posting a selfie. It makes you feel worse, even if you've retouched it and beautified it. Editing your image actually worsens your um, focus on the negative and your weaknesses because now you're trying to hide them you're trying to change it so in the end it creates a pattern of thinking that you now realize how am I going to look at the outside world for them am I going to look beautiful what will people think of me so you get on a roller coaster and you feel anxious and you get try to get reassurance from others about your looks but that reassurance doesn't reassure uh, it only lasts a short period of time, so that people do that with selfies as well. And I've seen hilarious things on the beach. Uh, yeah. So, what can you do practically? A little bit, take breaks from your phone. Uh, do other things, or instead of posting selfies and looking at other people's selfies and, and bodies and whatever. Do, th do stuff with your time that does not involve you you're uh, looking at your body or trying to i'm not saying go, don't go to the gym go to the gym do those things but do other things as well that does not just focus on your body and trying to live healthily and trying to build up yourself your body and, and um, it's also important to think of who you're following on the internet uh, who's your ideals uh, your ideal people um, why are you following them and then interestingly uh, balance your uh, what you view actually on the internet with with things like educational stuff and nature and art and those things so that it isn't just about people and 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 because they tend to post a lot about them, uh, their bodies what's happening there's a trend now with what they call media literacy programs to promote the understanding uh, amongst young people that they understand what the what the effect of media is on them and that they can see and deal with that effect early enough so that they have filters through which to uh, take that information but okay interesting your weight in your body image so research shows that uh, using your body shape to determine your self-worth may actually lead you to uh, gain more weight in the long run so if you say the way I'm weighing what I'm weighing determines what my self-worth is then you will actually try to solve that all the time and and in the end you will get on that roller coaster of gaining weight losing weight gaining weight losing weight and never actually getting to the place of feeling better about yourself and and um 
And what happens is, is uh, you get to a place what they call restrained eaters or chronic dieters. Those are people on the on and off dieters who, who are overly concerned about their weight. So they either have developed medical problems or whatever, but they are chronic dieters. They're chronically aware of food. And when you listen to their conversations, they are chronically talking about weight or looks or and they're very set on how they look. Um, they are the person who would feel extremely embarrassed as well if something happened uh, and if they looked a bit more uh, un, you know if they if something embarrassed them in in front of their peers so <clears throat> what's interesting is if you if they if a chronic dieter has spoken to somebody else uh, a new person and they've gained a lot of information from that person about who they are, what they will remember is that person's eating and weighing and dieting habits. They will remember that the most so because they're so focused on it, meaning that's what they gather information on. So they actually become obsessed about it without really understanding and realizing it. Um, so that vicious cycle. Uh, I, and I've got lots of empathy here for women. I'm so in saying all of these things, I'm saying you are exposed to a whole lot of images around you and to uh, people who are most of them are focused on dealing with uh, your body and changing the way you look and trying to look as beautiful as possible. And and in the end, you you either feel good about yourself or not. And either you're too thin or too, too, too fat and um, and you always compare you're always compared. And if you're not the one who's mostly comparing yourself, others might be, or they might be comparing themselves to you. So in the end, it's it's just hard. So there's a vicious cycle, uh, trying to reach that ideal body weight to, so that you can feel worthy, attractive, and good enough. It's like running up a steep, wet, and slippery mountain slide. Side. I mean, you, you sometimes make progress, but only to slip back. So it seems that you will never reach the top. And, um, and when you do, you actually have to balance on this thin piece of rock and you inevitably slide down and then try again. And, and I mean, you're on the track of aging. So uh, crow's feet happens, especially if you laugh a lot and um, and wrinkles and, you know, your all those things. So what happens is, is that you you in time, your feelings about yourself also become a bit more distorted because you're so focused on trying to change yourself. Uh, you start to value compliments a lot, compliments on your beauty and your outer looks, and you feel very hurt in, when somebody criticizes that. You compare yourself to others, like I said, and um, in the end, your self-confidence hinges on these looks. I mean, I found ladies who are in their 80s and they still, uh, the way they look is very important, and, um, and uh, they also are exactly doing exactly the same. And when you're an adolescent or a teenager, I mean, that is just everything. And the way people, girls and boys, treat you and whether they like you or whether they send likes or beauties, or oh, it looks so pretty. I mean, all those things just uh, define you, you know, and it just says whether you are good enough or not. So then you rebel against that standard, either that um, or you feel the need to uh, lose weight and to try and fit in. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's a very difficult pattern of not feeling good enough. Now, sometimes people, some ladies' husbands also reject them and prescribe to them and tell them, listen, this is how you've got to look. I've had, I had a husband in my practice. He said, and I mean, the lady really, she's athletic. She's, uh, she's, uh, she's weighing, um, her BMI. And I think BMI is also a bit strict, but they've got that. And she's, she looks, she's fine. He is highly critical. Um, and, and that just caused so much anxiety for her. For some ladies, it causes anger. So in the end, they don't feel accepted. They don't feel loved. So it's hurtful. In the end, that judgment from others, especially if it's from your husband, uh, your boyfriend, it becomes very hard. And, um, and one lady told me today that uh, the problem with being uh, overweight or struggling with your weight is that your, your battle is visible to others, whereas some other people have secret sins with that's not so easily visible. And I mean, that's also pertinent because if your battle is visible to others, it's hard because now you're easily judged, isn't it? And, um, and, and that's true. So the, the thing is, your body is visible to other people. So, and we tend to sometimes, and so I found that people tend to make jokes about other people's bodies or they joke about themselves. I love to do that about my bald head and whatever. 
But I even got a comment yesterday about my boop that is a little bit of a, a flabby on my tummy. So, and, um, and somebody was just saying that so that they could, because they actually have a bigger tummy than me. So, and um, trying to, trying to just put me down. It impacts me. It impacted. It would impact you. It would have that effect of you. You're not good enough, or you're bad, or you don't look good enough. So I had to then deal with it internally, as to what. what and I mean, I've dealt with criticism on my bald head. I mean, when you're 19 and you're beginning to be bald, I mean, it causes a lot of insecurity, and and I was ridiculed a lot. So I had to deal with this criticism from the outside and to really ask those questions. And the questions would be, and that's where CBT comes in, cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a wonderful therapy that's been really researched a lot. And it teaches us about our thinking and the effect of our thinking on our feelings and then on our behavior and how all of those interplay. In the end, what we need to do is we need to evaluate what our thinking says. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt, the, uh, uh, in the 40s, uh, you know, she lived in the, early part of the previous century. She was the wife of, of Franklin Roosevelt, the US president back then. And she said, nobody can, uh, or somebody can only insult you with your permission. Meaning there is a process in your mind that goes on before you accept um, a criticism and, or even a compliment. So you actually deal with it. So CBT offers you the, the um, the tools to actually work with your own thinking and to determine whether your own thinking is distorted. So when you make certain conclusions, how this works is whether you look at the mirror or you look at something else and what then happens is, is you, you have a thought about yourself. Now that comes from your past. Indeed, it comes from attachments. It comes from how you've been treated, your culture. It comes from what you've internalized as a child. There's a lot, there are lots of theories about those things. And you have schemas internally. So the psychology talks a lot about that. But in the end, you are dealing with a lot of this insecurity and hurts. So what then happens is, is that, that you have a, an initial thought about yourself and you make a conclusion. Or a situation makes elicit something with you. Um, suddenly you have to swim in front of other girls and you have to undress or something, whatever happens, and you are um, embarrassed. And then a thought comes into your mind that says something and it might be a distorted thinking like you have to look like this or you don't look like that. You, you feel shame and then you conclude something. So what we then do is we have a look at those thoughts and we ask questions as to what was your interpretation of that situation. So um, when that guy told me, oh, your tummy is walking ahead of you, it's, you know, it's um, walking away for you, <laughs> from you. So it is what I then in immediately thought was, oh, there's a criticism on my tummy. I, uh, I, I had the thought, this, is a, this means my tummy is too big. And, and that means I'm not good enough. So but then I, what we call, I discounted it or I questioned it. And I said, am I my tummy? No, I'm not my tummy. Why is he saying this to me? He probably has some issue with his tummy or whatever. I don't know. It hit me. I don't. It doesn't make me feel lacquer. It doesn't make me feel nice. But that does not mean that I have problems with my tummy, that I am a problem, you know. So it, it actually means that, my, that I have to deal with the, the criticism that comes my way. So what happens is, is if, you, if you deal with the criticism that comes from other people by internalizing it and then starting to take it because it matches with what we call your core beliefs about yourself. That means deep down in your heart, what do you think? I am ugly. I'm not good enough. I'm fat. I'm whatever. And if you have those thoughts about yourself, I'm ugly, I'm fat, I'm not good enough, then what will happen is, is you will end up feeling inferior. So it is about asking questions about those things. Looking at, am I creating unrealistic or unreasonable standards for myself? Am I saying that I have to be this? I have to look like that. I cannot be this. I cannot be that. Sorry, there's my dog going on. It's life happening around me. <laughs> so 
uh, lives happening? Uh, yes. So what happens here is that if you ask those questions and you um, and you just accept it, that's when it's going to hit you. And that's when you're going to ponder on it and you're going to sit with it. And in the end, it's going to make you feel inferior and it's going to confirm this belief. So you need to learn how to challenge the beliefs. And, and then what you do is you need to start to learn to replace them with truth. Now, I can't go into too much depth with that. And, and there'll be a workshop soon. Hopefully it'll be uh, online next year sometime. We'll work on that. But we'll provide a workshop for this. And to really empower you to say, okay, who am I? And how am I going to deal with these thoughts about myself? And thoughts that other people tend to throw my way. Okay, so... In the end, um, you you will tell yourself, I, I either eat too much or too little. I try to find comfort in food or I don't. I just keep food away from myself. I lose that balance and I, you know, I, I just say I forget actually how to deal with my anxiety and I uh, and, and how to deal with it with the Lord. So in the in the end, I, I'm just turning around in the cycle. So we need to learn how to get out of it. Now, if you're a Christian, it all boils down to your relationship with the Lord and your identity. That means who you are. In the end, what do you conclude? Who do you agree with? Do you agree with the culture? Do you agree with God? Do you agree with people around you? Who do you agree with? Um, and that agreement that you make is very important because in the end, you have the choice to decide who are you going to side with? Are you going to go against yourself or are you going to go against you uh, or against the lie so it, let me let me simplify it it ends up being truth or lies so it's about what is true and what is not true yes you might have heard a lot of negative comments from your past you might have been criticized ridiculed bullied uh, rejected even by your parents about your body image and and, and people might have given you a hard time but um, now that you're an adult or you are an adolescent or whoever a teenager, you have the ability to choose to say, what am I going to decide? And am I going to side with God? I just want to read a, a portion for you from Cynthia Garrett's uh, propelwomen.org. Let's just have a look. She says, nobody in the world is like you. We hear this. Yet I think the biggest challenge people, especially women, face is in loving and embracing their real identity. Historically, we've been broken down by all kinds of abuses. Women have been marginalized, denied our place of relevance, and categorically made to embrace a lower self-esteem rather than a powerful confidence. We've been taught to seek identity in social media, relationships, career, kids, money, books, magazines, uh, looks, I might add, through spiritual leaders, husbands. Uh, but we seek identity everywhere, but in Jesus Christ, the author and creator of our identity. So that's where you need to actually come down to and say, who am I? I need to go and look at, at who made me. If I want to find out whether my car has value, I go to look at the, uh, the manufacturer. Who made it? BMW, Mercedes, uh, who, who made it? That determines the value. And then um, if we have a look at your body and we say, who made it? It is God who made it. So you are made in his image. And, um, and, and, and as uh, your body is then also made in his image. And, uh, and the Lord declared it to be very good. Now, what we say is immediately the thought comes in, yes, but. So that means I am differing. I'm saying, yes, this is true, but. Yes, you're right. There is a but. The culture gives you a big but. Nee, not a big butt on the behind, a big butt again <laughs> after the comma. So the culture says yes, but, and you can tend to then agree. The devil will say yes, but. Your, some of your friends might say yes, but, or whoever. In the end, what do you say? Who do you agree with? If, um, if you start to seek your self-worth in a great body, in being a good mom, a wife, entrepreneur, whatever, all of that in the end will have elements of failure in them. So if you're, if you, and, and, and to be honest with you, if you, a lot of broken women will lead to a lot of brokenness in, in the body of Christ. So God wants to build up the woman and then um, he wants to build up your identity. <clears throat> he wants to turn it around and say, hey, I gave you that body um, and I'll teach you where that body fits into the my picture. So what you want to do is get out of, because you're looking through the lens of 
either your past or your and the world, but to go and put on God's lenses so that you can have a look at how he sees you. Because your identity, if your identity is found outside of that, outside of Christ, then you're trying to bring glory to yourself. But you were created to bring glory to Christ. Uh, you are his body and his image. So it's a whole different thing. Feminists um, have done a lot of good things in the past. They have um, they have attacked a lot of very um, nasty um, male-dominated stuff and, 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 and injustices. But there's something that has gone too far, which has said your body is your own property. But in the end, it actually belongs to the Lord because it's his badge that's on there. He's the manufacturer. He owns it. So if he owns it... Um, and, and that means he has the last say about it. So you need to find out what he says. Now, I just want to give you some ideas on what the research shows with regards to faith and body image. It's interesting that um, there's evidence that theistic, that means um, religious affirmations, might buffer against the negative effect of media on the body image. And um, um, they've, another study said um, women who read um, you know, religious affirmations and with a Christian-based tone that emphasized God's love and acceptance of their bodies were actually um, women who felt more acceptance towards their looks and who, and they felt more in, uh, actually better about themselves. So they were affirming to themselves the love of God and, um, and, and how God would look at their appearance. And that has strengthened their resolve to resist the lies or the judgments, or the standard of the culture. So they were then able to say, oh, wait, wait, no. Speak to the hand. Your face ain't listening. So they were able to say, no, nope, I'm not going to do this. This is the truth. Uh, so you're, the question to you is then, are you letting others determine your identity and your self-worth or God? So where do you find your identity? And uh, that's another question. I am thirsty tonight. Let's have a look at another one that might be a bit hard to hear, but it is true. If your body becomes such an obsession or such a, an important part of your identity actually becomes idolatry, meaning that it becomes more important than what God says. And, God, and, and if it's more important than what God says, it's more important than God. Now, if you look, have a look at the Ark of the Covenant in 1 Samuel 5 verse 2. The Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines and it was put in the Temple of Dagon. And what happened is the ark uh, is God's intimate presence and his power. And the next morning when the Philistines got into the temple, the Dagon was on his face. And the next morning after that, he was shattered. Meaning that if, uh, if the Holy Spirit's presence and the truth of the Lord, the truth comes in, the lies will actually have to fall to their faces. The idols. So the this will set the record straight but then there's the stuff that you've put in in place of the lord's word uh, ahead of the truth will actually have to bow down but you'll have to accept that um, because you know when you're a christian you've died with christ and you've risen with him to a new life your old self has died with him and your new self is now alive in him so how he sees you is in, is incredibly important so i'm going to have just have a few go through a few scriptures with you and just give some explanation to us how I understand them. 1 Peter 3 verse 3 to 4 says, an important thing, you knew I was going to quote this. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of your hair and the putting on of gold, jewelry, clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person, the inner beauty uh, of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So the Lord um, affirms to you, that your beauty is actually inside because that is eternal that's imperishable he's not saying that it is sinful to adorn yourself he's saying he's comparing telling these women the egyptian women of those days were overly concerned with their um, physical beauty and spending hours trying to look pretty and rejecting or neglecting their inner beauty but the lord says hey your inner beauty is of vastly more importance. Does that now mean you reject and you uh, neglect your outer beauty? No, it doesn't. What you do is you then take um, responsibility for your body. 
if you're married your body belongs to your your husband and your husband's body belongs to you so you look after your body you beautify because your husband actually delights in your body um you know your body is you don't um your body is what the lord actually what where the lord dwells so he says your body is a beautiful place where the holy spirit dwells um so you look after your body, you take care of it, you um, exercise it, you you make it pretty. But when it comes to who, your, the value you have, and if your body is not perfect, let's say you're in an accident and you, can, you're, you have an amputated arm or you have a disfigured face, does that now affect your worth? No, it cannot affect your inner beauty. So what it says is that where you place a lot of emphasis and where you inject a lot of energy where you work the hardest at you should be the inner part because that strengthens you as well so even when you're 87 and you stock out that means you're very old as old as wood i don't know it's that's yeah it's a stick old stick old even when you're 87 years so old your inner beauty is continuing to grow because you're in love with jesus and and he is your adornment now it says that um uh, I've heard this, a girl, uh, I read this, a young girl said this, your body is like a phone case, she said. The case makes it pretty. The phone, what's inside the case, that is the important part. So it's what's inside. It's not what's on top. So it's what's inside that is important. Now you know, you know this, but you know, when we over-focus on our bodies, what happens is that we become self uh, focused and in the end self-obsessed whereas we want to be God focused we want to behold his beauty and worship him for his beauty because his beauty is everlasting and then that will transform us from glory to glory so it's about soaking in how he he looks and who he is and then that transforms you and it fills you with his presence and that's just awesome now you know that your body is a sacred place the place of the Holy Spirit um, and you know that the, that the Lord paid a high price for it, whether it be above the social standard or not. He bought it anyway. And he indwells you anyway. He does not say lose three kilograms or ten pounds and then I will indwell your body. It, he doesn't say go to the gym three times a week and do the following program or I'll leave your body. Because you're not toned. I mean, that's ridiculous. So the Holy Spirit stays there irrespective. Even if you have uh, obesity. Now, we don't want to go to either obesity or anorexic uh, uh, slides, slides. You know, that is unhealthy. We need to move to a healthier place of healthy living. But you rigidly almost place the emphasis on the internal beauty. And you beautify yourself outside, but you go and you, uh, and you work hard at taking that inner beauty. Know that there will be a war in your mind. And the war will continue. Um, and you might even have this paradox. Somebody told me, a lady in our uh, group, Monique, told me that there's a paradox. Even the scripture of the, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit can make you feel inferior if the enemy can use it against you to say, yes, you see, you're not really a temple. I mean, if you want to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, you got to look really good. I mean, that's not the Lord's standard. That's the enemy. To just remind you that you're under his grace. Yes, you try and, and, and look after your body. And if you've fallen, you're under his grace. Um, if you've gone either to the anorexic side, meaning you're trying to starve yourself to look better, or you've gone to the obesity side, uh, you're under his grace. You come back to his love for you. You come back to how he feels about you. His unconditional love says, I, I've loved you even when you were a sinner. So I've loved your body as well. Does that mean I'm going to say, yes, just eat hamburgers and chips and pizza all day long? No, come to me, he says, I will help you. But he will detach to almost say to you, I love you just as you are. Um, and just to remind you, one day he's going to change your body into an eternal body. Um, but your body is not just, it's not really the only you. You are spirit, you have a soul, a will, emotions and thinking, and you live in a body. It's a temporal body. I just want to read you something from John Piper. He says, the deepest root of womanhood is hope in God. The deepest root of Christian womanhood 
He says that's where you start to define Christian womanhood. There's a scripture in Peter that says, holy women who hope in God, who used to adorn themselves in a certain way. They did not put their hope in husbands, in their looks, in other outside things, external things. They put their hope in the Lord, meaning that's where their worth comes from. That's where their strength, their anchor is, is in the Lord. Proverbs 31, 25 says, strength and dignity are her clothing. So it is, she's clothing herself with strength and dignity. Whose strength? The Lord's strength. She's weak, but she comes to the Lord and she's, she puts on Jesus Christ. So it, how you look on the outside. Now, this does not mean you just neglect your body, like I said. Um, you exercise it and you need to lose weight and you need to become more healthy. Because if you die 20 years before your time, because you, you've just had a lot of junk food, and that's also not taking responsibility, but it does not mean that that's who you are. Now, Song of Solomon 4, verse 7 says, The husband says to the wife, You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Now, I mean, he's just telling her, I love you just the way you are. And she's beautiful to him. So your husband needs to delight in you as well, the way that you are. Yes, I know a lot of them don't. And that's where prayer comes in. And, and that's a difficult one. That's rejection. And it's hard. But know that the Lord does not reject you. So yes, we need to pray for our husbands in the way they see us. They, they see you because you are your husband's also affected by the culture and the standards and by the same comparisons. And if they apply to you, it's also unfair. Yes, I don't have time to tell you what to do about that. We might look at that in uh, during our workshop. There's another one, uh, Proverbs 31 verse 30, that says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Now remember, the Lord says He will He will protect you. He will um, He will stand up for you. So if you fear Him first and you look you look to Him, what will happen is is the Lord will start to work in the people around you. So He will stand up for you. He will make your righteousness shine like the noonday sun. He will fight for you. Remember, the Lord says He's He never really loses. You know. So if you fear him and you and you look to him, what he, what happens is that inevitably the light shines and the darkness has to flee. Now, the Lord has made it clear that the outside appearance is not that important for him. 1 Samuel 16, 70, 7, he says, but the Lord said to Samuel, so Samuel's going to look for the king. He's, the Lord said, go to uh, choose a king. And, and, and he was going to actually choose David. And all of his brothers are there. And then uh, the Lord said, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. It's that's one of the brothers. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Why? Because the heart's where the eternal. So yes, man looks at the outward appearance. We know that you are going to do that again and again. Um, but now you you have something to pull yourself back to to say, hey, I'm I can look like the Lord at the inward appearance. Um, and yes, you're going to go to a party uh, next week and you will find more prettier women and other more beautiful people. And you'll see that and you will have probably have the thought of, oh, goodness, I'm not good enough or I'm too this, I'm too little that. And then you deal with that. You say, hey, wait, I don't have to accept this. What's the truth? Um, so here's another one of a husband that delights in his wife. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. So, um, husbands, if you're listening to this, delight in your wife. Give her that delight, irrespective of how she looks, because otherwise you are going to put a standard for her. If she says you have to earn this, otherwise you're not a good husband, that's also conditional acceptance. Remember in the Bible, the Lord talks about character, virtue, a relationship with him, obedience, love, faith, hope. Those things are important. Now I'm going to end with a number of statements that come from Bible verses for women that are very strong promises you are loved just the way you are a body soul and spirit you are loved you are not condemned your body is also not condemned even though you're not on your ideal size or weight and even in if you are that does not mean you're that's not why you're not condemned you're accepted because christ accepted you he's washed you with his blood um, if you've accepted him and you've put your trust in him then he has taken you out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light, of the son of his love. You are now beautiful before the Lord because you are righteous in him.
So you are included in his family. You are accepted before him. You are not alone anymore. You are wonderfully made because he made you. He attended to your body and he chose that body for you. And you are free. You are free from lies. You are free from the devil and death, meaning that, that you can actually choose now with the Holy Spirit in you. you. You belong to the Lord and you are chosen by him. And you are no longer a slave to sin because falling for lies and repeating them is actually sinful. But this is a wonderful scripture in Colossians 2 verse 9 to 10. It says, for in Jesus dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he's got the Trinity in him. He is all of the fullness of the Godhead. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. If the Lord says you are complete in him, that means he's given you his completeness. That means even though your body is not where you want it to be, you are complete. So your worth is connected to how Christ sees you and what he thinks of you. And um, so when you find yourself doubting your body again and looking at your body and saying nasty things about it, that means you are confessing the agreement that you made with the enemy, the lie. Then you need to confess it and say, Lord, you know what, I'm, I'm actually, I'm just setting forth a pattern of lies here. Let me stop this. It's like saying the earth is flat. Uh, the sky is going to fall down tomorrow. Um, my dog is as big as an elephant. Uh, cars can fly already. I mean, those things are lies, you know. Um, there are, if you if you do that, you are just perpetuating a lie. So what you do is you stop that, you catch that thought, and you question it with the word. And you say, hey, the word says I'm complete. Now, initially, you won't feel it because the lies attach so strongly. It elicits a lot of feelings from you of unworthiness and, it, and you've got a lot of lies in your past so it'll have probably have some therapeutic work to do there but it's okay the lord's with you and he will help you just choose to turn back to him and, and take the truth okay there are a few big books that i can recommend and we'll put that on on the facebook as well uh, the power of identity from cynthia garrett um a captivating from john and stacy aldridge uh, thin within, which is a, a hunger fullness Christian. Um, it's not a dieting plan. It's a, uh, a, a, a dealing with learning how to deal with food and your food issues. And Reclaiming Eve, the Identity and Calling of Women in the Kingdom of God by uh, Suzanne Burden, Carlos Sunberg, and Jamie Wright. So I'm going to put those names on. But the Lord bless you and he keep you. And I pray that he makes his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And may the Lord Jesus um, just just amplify this word to you that you are loved and that that you lay down that false identity of just your body um, who that is who you are but that he in him he is who you are that you that you find your identity in him and that you then love your body and look after it because he's given it to you for a time so god bless you and um, in two weeks time we're going to look at grief and uh, people who's experienced losses and how to deal with that all of the best. Cheers.